Dr. Shaquille Kowser. I'm uh, a nephrologist here in Anderson, South Carolina, and uh, uh, I've been, uh, first of all, I want to thank Apna Merit for giving me the opportunity to give a talk on hypertension. It's uh, my pleasure and honor to speak to my colleagues in Pakistan. I also want to take a minute to say hello to my colleagues in uh, Dow Medical College and Civil Hospital, which is my uh, alma mater. As you know, hypertension is a very huge topic and uh, really uh, it is hard to do it justice by speaking in 45 minutes on this talk. Uh, but uh, when I was trying to prepare for this talk, uh, I was not sure where to start and uh, where to end. Today what I have done is uh, I have uh, given an outline of hypertension with some emphasis on the important points related to management and some clinical trials. <clears throat> For some of you this talk might be a little uh, easy or elementary but uh, mostly but it is mostly directed towards the house officers and medical students and as I was told that uh, majority of the uh, audience uh, uh, our house officers and, stu and uh, medical students. But I'm sure and I think that everyone who, is li who will listen to this talk will take few points home. Uh, we will have I think 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the talk uh, for a few question answers and I'll be glad to take some at that time. Without further delay I'm going to start. <coughs> Okay, the, uh, the topic is update on the management of hypertension and what we'll do in this approximately 40 minutes, we will talk uh, briefly how to classify hypertension by saying that this the patient have hypertension and we'll talk about different types of hypertension and then briefly we'll talk about what types of hypertension are there? Is this a benign hypertension or a malignant hypertension? We'll talk about different etiologies of hypertension, talk about the organ damage, and then we will briefly talk about different ways to treat hypertension. And uh, we'll talk about some medications and trials at the end. Okay. This uh, slide uh, is uh, this taken from a Time magazine cover in 2004 and, and this uh, uh, Time cover uh, can be true even in 2012 as you know high blood pressure is still the stellar killer uh, and there is a hypertensive crisis going on in the world. Dr. Labarat said it very well that there is a good evidence that hypertension can be controlled but it takes a lot of intense and sustained effort. A hypertension and national health crisis. This is the USA map but you can put a Pakistan map there, you can put a global map. Hypertension is a global health crisis and uh, in USA at least one out of four which is approximately 25 to 30 percent of the population has hypertension which comes out of about 65 million people. On an average, I think in Pakistan it's probably slightly higher but on average 20 to 40 percent of the population has hypertension globally. So there is a very high incidence of hypertension and uh, and even in USA there is a majority of the patients who are diagnosed with hypertension are not at goal. At least 
70% of the patients who are treated, they are not attaining the goal of hypertension. And approximately one third of the patients have, don't even know they have a hypertension. So I think in a developing country like Pakistan, these numbers are probably much more worse. So it is, as our physicians, it's our duty to uh, uh, increase the awareness and then treat the patients uh, aggressively as I will tell you the reasons as we progress in the talk. How to classify blood pressures? All of you know that normal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80. Uh, this is uh, basically data from GNC7, which is the Joint National Committee in USA, which gives recommendations, classification of hypertension. And uh, uh, GNC8 is coming out very soon, and there will be some changes uh, uh, in the diagnosis and classification of hypertension, but till then we will follow the guidelines given to us from JNC7. JNC7 also tells us that there is a category called prehypertension, which uh, basically means blood pressure between 120 and 140 systolic and the diastolic is 80 to 90. And their recommendation is that if the some patients that fall in the prehypertension range, they have to have lifestyle modification. There is no need for drug therapy. We have stage one hypertension and we have stage two hypertension. Stage two is systolic blood pressure more than 160. And of course you need uh, lifestyle modification as well as drug therapy uh, in stage one as well as stage two. So again, a uh, little bit more, few more points about prehypertension. As you know, once your blood pressure is in the prehypertension range, your risk for cardiovascular disease doubles. Every time your blood pressure goes 20 points above the normal of systolic. So from 120 to 140, your risk increases. So GNC requires, says that you need to have a lifestyle modification to prevent uh, development of frank hypertension as well as cardiovascular uh, disease and morbidity. And uh, in any uh, case, patient involvement is the key. Why is the hypertension important? Because as we know, even patients who are normal tensive at age 55, they have a 90% lifetime risk to develop hypertension. As you age, as you know, the risk of developing hypertension increases because of many reasons, including stiffening of the uh, arterials. So the public health goal in USA, in the whole world, is to prevent hypertension and cardiovascular disease before it happens. That's why there is a lot of emphasis on prehypertension, which is the uh, the actually the you know just before the hypertension. So that is why we have that's why I have two slides on prehypertension. Okay, how do you measure hypertension? Now we have classified that these are the numbers that we are looking. We have you know prehypertension, then we have stage one and stage two. How do you uh, measure them. If somebody is first time getting diagnosed, it's not in this slide, but uh, what you have to do is you have to check their blood pressure once a week times three, and out of that two, if the blood pressure is above 140 over 90, uh, they are classified to be hypertensive and start on drug therapy. When these patients come for a follow-up in your clinic or office, you have to take at least two readings, and I, here it says five minutes apart, but uh, it can be as long as you can. The longer the better. The patient should sit in a chair with their feet on the ground and a back support, and you take blood pressure in both arms and usually use the arm that has the higher blood pressure. Self-measurement is the new thing to do. 
I think it is a very uh, good tool, which is called home monitoring and uh, or ambulatory monitoring. It provides information on how the response to the therapy is. It also gives the patients to know how they are doing. It also helps to differentiate between white coat hypertension. This is how you measure and make sure these patients are doing right. Uh, this slide will tell you that uh, the major cardiovascular morbidity, which is coronary heart disease, stroke, peripheral artery disease, and heart failure, the four major ones, and the hypertensive patients have at least two to four times more risk of developing coronary heart disease, stroke, peripheral artery disease, and heart failure. We'll skip this slide. So uh, to summarize the last few slides we have seen is basically is the goal is to get to the goal. So the goal for all physicians who are treating hypertensive patients is 140 over 90. And if these patients have diabetes or kidney disease, especially with proteinuria, we need to shoot for a lower goal, which is 130 over 80. So that is the goal, and all of us should make our goal to get to that goal. Okay. If you don't get to the goal, then what are our risks? And what are the risks we are putting the patients on with untreated hypertension? These are some of the consequences of untreated hypertension. So when we don't treat the patient, we put this patient at risk of having an aortic aneurysm, cerebrovascular accident, coronary artery disease, chronic renal insufficiency, especially in proteinuria, congestive cardiac failure, dementia, MI, peripheral vascular disease. So a lot of bad things can happen if we don't treat the patient aggressively and get to our goal. Uh, a, a brief discussion about benign and malignant hypertension. Of course, benign is not benign, but it is, maybe you can call it slow hypertension and a malignant hypertension. The hypertension cannot be benign. But, uh, Usually it is a gradual onset, where malignant you have a sudden uh, hypertensive crisis, blood pressure shoots up, systolic blood pressure more than 200, diastolic more than 130. And what it does is, uh, in gradual onset it is a slow damage, it causes nephrosclerosis, renal atrophy. If you examine their eyes, you will see that there is arterial narrowing of the, on the fundoscopic exam, you know, unfortunately, the fundoscopic exam is getting less and less practice in day to day a, a physical examination. Uh, renal failure is very slow and progressive. While in malignant hypertension, you, if you look at the kidneys, you get ischemia, microinfarctions, you have hemorrhages, you have papillary edema, if you do a fundoscopic examination, I have seen a couple of papillary edemas, and, uh, and then these patients are also at risk of having a rapidly progressive renal failure. So, after we have talked about uh, the risks of hypertension, we're going to talk about briefly some of the etiology of hypertension. Lifestyle factors are very important. Excess body weight, obesity, is very common in USA and certain parts of the other world. And excess dietary sodium, common 
all over the world. Of course, Pakistani dish are very high in sodium and our foods are very, very high in sodium. So we need to definitely discuss with our patients about the dietary sodium intake. If you use physical activity, very important, inadequate fruit, vegetable and potassium intake, excess alcohol consumption can cause that too. So these are some of the lifestyle factors that can call, that play a role in hypertension. Okay, briefly talk about essential hypertension. This essential hypertension can be called uh, benign hypertension, is called uh, primary hypertension, is called uh, just hypertension. So there are different names to this, but basically this is the hypertension which is about 80 to 90 percent of the people have it, means idiopathic hypertension, does not have a specific etiology. But there are certain risks or factors that uh, play a role in essential hypertension. Genetic factors, there's a little data, clinical data that if your father, mother or one or both have hypertension, you are at risk for developing hypertension in your later life. Diet, if you are on a very, very high sodium diet, that can put you at risk of having essential hypertension. Vein angiotensin, of course, you know, uh, certain pops, groups of populations have certain level of renin angiotensin activity. Uh, in USA, uh, the Caucasian people have a little hyperactive renin axis. African Americans have uh, low renin, so they are salt sensitive. So this uh, is a little genetic in origin. I'm not sure about the Asians. I think the Asians, the South Asians, also have low renin type hypertension, which is also called salt sensitive. Increased sympathetic nervous system, which includes uh, basically, you know, stress, type A personality, anxiety, can all play a role in unmasking the hypertension. Now, renal function, it is, uh, just want to talk about it, this is a very uh, important concept and what it is basically when, if you have intrauterine fetal growth retardation, for whatever reason, it could be a preterm, it could be hypoxia during the birth, malnutrition, infection in the, uh, during the uh, pregnancy of the mother, all that can put stress on the fetus and uh, low birth weight. So these patients, when, they, when these babies which are born with these type of problems, they have low nephron mass and, and studies have shown that these patients are at higher risk of developing hypertension. What are the ad identifiable causes of hypertension? So just to summarize last two slides, we talked about the lifestyle factors. We talked about uh, birth weight, we talked about uh, sodium intake, exercise and, uh, uh, and fruits and vegetable uh, decrease intake of that. We talked about essential idiopathic hypertension and some of the factors that can play a role in that. Then we're going to talk about the secondary causes of hypertension that, you know, sleep apnea. This will go by the frequency. Sleep apnea is very common, as you know. 20% uh, of the time, diagnosis is uh, uh, excessive sleepness in the uh, daytime, fatigue, difficulty concentration, and hypertension. Drug-induced, uh, drug-induced uh, 
hypertension. There are many drugs. We'll talk briefly that it's a very important cause of hypertension, and all of all the physicians who uh, are treating hypertensive patients should look into this cause. Chronic kidney disease can cause hypertension. Hypertension can give chronic kidney disease. So it is two two way traffic. Primary aldosteronism also a very important overlooked cause of hypertension. The clue is hypokalemia and hypertension, renovascular disease. This is mostly common in patients who have other vascular problems. They have uh, peripheral vascular disease, they have stroke, carotid disease, so they have more, they have, we call them vasculopath, atherosclerosis, chronic steroid therapy, Cushing syndrome, pheochromocytoma, less common as you go down the list, less common, co of the aorta, and thyroid and parathyroid uh, diseases also can cause hypertension. So these are the causes, just whenever you are treating the patient in your mind, you should have at, at least this other causes, we call them secondary causes. Now, you know, all of us get frustrated when we, we treat a patient, we think we have uh, uh, got the patient control, but there is always 20 to 30 patients, percent of the patients whose blood pressure is difficult to control. Uh, we call them resistant hypertension, and there are certain reasons for that. Number one is improper BP measurement. Remember, the cuff of the uh, BP uh, machine, the cuff that you measure the blood pressure should be of appropriate size. Now, if it is too small for somebody who's, who has a large arm, you'll always have a, a falsely, falsely high blood pressure. If it is too big for somebody who has a very uh, small arm, again, you will have false So You have to have the, the numbers are 40%, the width of the cuff, width of the cuff should be 40% of the circumference of the arm. And the length of the cuff should be 80% of the circumference of the arm. You can give all the medication in the world, if these patients are going to eat all the sodium, all the salt, you cannot make a dent. Inadequate diuretic therapy. This patient is on two or three blood pressure medication and there is no diuretic in their blood pressure regimen, then sometime adding a diuretic, you can get the blood pressure to the goal. Medications, sometimes we are not using enough doses. Drug interaction is a very, very important uh, cause of resistant hypertension. Patients are taking over the counter medications such as. Uh, NSAIDs, Motrin, Advil, aspirin, they're using illegal drugs, they're taking sympathomimetics, they're on birth control pills, all of them will interact with the blood pressure medications and you will have resistant hypertension. Herbal supplements, sometimes have prednisone, Hakeem medications, so we have to look at this if somebody is not getting controlled by one or two medications. Alcohol intake, and then we look at the other causes that we just talked in the previous slide. Drug-induced steroids, very important, commonly used by many doctors, Hakeem's, homeopathic medications. So we have to look to see if these patients are on steroids or not, estrogens in females for oral contraceptives or postmenopausal, NSAIDs, over-the-counter, very common, is used very regularly by females, so we have to make sure this patient is not on NSAIDs, phenylpropanolamines, these are the, in the cough syrups, uh, decongestants, decongestants, transplant patients have cyclosporin and tacrolimus prograph, Erythropoietin is common to bring for treatment of anemia. It's one of the very important causes of hypertension. The less common are ergotamine, you know, for uh, uh, migraine headaches. Then are some of the anesthetics. 
And a lot of people don't know that antidepressants, especially when laxophene and buspirone, and they can also cause hypertension. So there are a lot of very drug-induced hypertension we have to always keep in mind. There is a medication called clonidine. I have it here causing hypertension, and all of us have used clonidine for blood pressure control. But remember, clonidine is one of the most important cause of withdrawal hypertension. Somebody is on clonidine and they stop taking it for a few days, they'll have a very severe rebound, rebound hypertension. So if you put somebody, you tell them that don't stop it abruptly because really you can have, I've seen patients with systolic blood pressure 240, if they have stopped taking clonidine for a few days or they ran out of the prescription or just stopped taking it. So clonidine is a very important cause of rebound hypertension. COX-2 inhibitors, I will just quickly briefly talk about um, COX-2 inhibitors. Don't use that very much nowadays. I don't know in Pakistan how much they're using it. Vioxx, Celebrex, Vioxx is banned. Celebrex is still available but uh, not common. Of course, NSAIDs are a number one uh, epidemic all over the world. People use it for headaches, body aches for all kinds of aches as, and, 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 and uh, they are notorious in causing hypertension and drug to drug interaction. Uh, case reports of severe increase in BP exist in patients for after one dose and more typically even after four weeks and but usually it is four weeks of regular usage that can give you trouble. So on and off you can use it, it's not a major problem. But there are reports of, you know, if there is severe blood pressure can go up just by using one dose. So would consider telling these patients to use uh, paracetamol, I think, right? It had acetaminophen or uh, one of the derivatives. So I think that is safe. We call them Tylenol here. Again, just uh, to tell you what are the uh, few, uh, uh, how does NSAIDs, cause uh, hypertension. As you know, in the kidney, there is the efferent glomeruli and the efferent glomeruli. And uh, the F, uh, all the prostaglandins in the kidney cause efferent, with A, vasodilatation. The NSAIDs and the COX inhibitors, they inhibit this prostaglandin synthesis. And that causes afferent vasoconstriction, when that happens, there is decreased perfusion in the glomeruli and that causes the nephrons and the kidneys to sense decreased perfusion to sense that and they increase the salt and water retention and causes renin release and that indirectly causes hypertension. And then, you know, so that sort of negate some of the blood pressure medications. So that's the physiological way it causes uh, hypertension. Drug-induced hypertension, street drugs are also very important. Herbal products, very common in Pakistan. Cocaine, not as much common, but some of the uh, herbal ecstasies, nicotine smoking, anabolic steroids, we briefly talk about that. Narcotic withdrawals, patients who are on, on heroin and, uh, and uh, other narcotics, they can get a severe rebound hypertension when they're in a withdrawal. Ethylphenidate, amphetamines, some of the ergot containing, ergot containing herbal products. So there are, every country has their own drug, street drug, they're a little bit different. Uh, so you might have, you know, some other different type of drugs, but we got to keep a look at these medications when we are treating patient hypertension, especially in patients who are, have resistant hypertension. Again, um, substances that are available in food, of course, salt, you know, a lot of, not in Pakistan, but in here, a lot of food is cooked, people use a lot of, <coughs> so ethanol is a problem, lecris, <coughs> is uh, is used, uh, I'm not sure in Pakistan, it's used uh, here as a food uh, substance, 
uh, and it can it blocks adrenal gland uh, uh, and there is increased aldosterone and causes hypertension in that way. Paramine containing foods, chemicals, rare causes, but they are there just to guys. Uh, okay, now what we're going to do briefly uh, is we talk about. So what we have gone again. I want to summarize what we have talked uh, so that you guys uh, understand. We talked about the classification of hypertension, different. Uh, type of uh, hypertension, pre-hypertension is very important. We talked about uh, stage one and stage two. Then we talked about the different, uh, how to measure hypertension. After that, we talked about what will happen if you don't treat the hypertension. And after that, we talked about different causes of hypertension. Uh, in that, the main points were the lifestyle factors are very important that a lot of people we don't pay attention to that. So one of my purpose of the talk is that take home message is always treat the lifestyle factors in treating hypertension. We'll talk briefly about that. We talked about essential hypertension. We talked about the secondary causes. Secondary causes itself can be a whole new topic. And then the other very important uh, purpose of the talk was to talk about drug interactions. Uh, NSAIDs and the other drugs we talked about, herbal medications, street drugs, we got to look and make sure these patients are not uh, taking it. After we talked about this, now we're going to discuss briefly about do a physical examination and see if these patients have any end organ damage. So, I mean, this is again a, a large topic, but I'm just trying to give you a brief. You look at the heart. This patient is in heart failure. You can get assesses if they have an echocardiogram. You can see if the ejection fraction is normal or low. When they have left ventricular hypertrophy, you can diagnose it by either EKG or echo. We look and listen to them and see if they have rals and they have they are in pulmonary edema. They have leg swelling. They can have ascites, which can also look at the JVD. So all of these things you are doing to see if the hypertension has caused some heart damage in terms of either hypertrophy, right heart failure, left heart failure. In the kidneys, you look for macroscopic hematuria. You look for proteinuria. And then you measure it, how much proteinuria, because that is important. You also look at elevated butyrin creatinine, decreased GFR. And after that, you also vessels also take the brunt of hypertension damage. So you look at uh, bruise, aneurysms, and fundi. So you can look into their eyes. You can see narrowing, papilledema, cotton wools. You can listen to uh, abdominal, definitely every patient who comes has to be listened to abdominal, for abdominal brewery, for air, abdominal aortic aneurysm. Very, very important. Carotid uh, artery. Okay. So once we have diagnosed, we look to see if these patients have any organ damage. We have, di we are, we have found out what are the, if they have as I said, 80 to 90 percent of patients have essential hypertension. Now, if these patients have a secondary cause, then you have to treat a secondary cause. This treatment, which I'm talking right now, is mostly focused for patients with essential hypertension. Okay, keep that in mind. The, for secondary causes, we have to treat the hypertension with medication, but at the same time, we have to treat the cause that is causing the hypertension. Also, in the treatment overview, we have to keep in mind that uh, uh, some of the compelling indications that you have. We'll talk briefly. Okay, 
So lifestyle modification again, a little bit more on fetus, drug therapy. Okay, this is a little busy slide, but uh, just to tell you, the first treatment of hepatitis starts with lifestyle modification. We'll talk briefly about that. Then we, if that does not bring the blood pressure to gold, then we start them on medications. If these patients don't have any compelling indications, and briefly I'll tell you that later on the slide, you know, that they are they have heart failure, chronic kidney disease, atrial flutter, and so forth, the treatment is a little bit different. If they have no compelling indications, then we will see if these patients are in stage one and stage two. If they're in stage one, you can do monotherapy. If they're in stage two, you do a combination therapy. And even if this patient after that, they don't uh, uh, come to the goal, then we have to scratch our head and look at um, other causes of resistant hypertension that I have talked earlier, drug drug interactions, illicit drugs, and other things we have to uh, look. Okay, lifestyle modification, again, as I said, uh, very important. If you look at this slide, at least 10, 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury we can get with blood pressure control. So, I mean, if somebody is 150 and if they just do these activities and they get 10 points low, they don't even need a drug. So, you know, by lifestyle modification, you can actually sometimes save this patient from drug therapy. So number one, the number one thing that in lifestyle modification that really makes, gives you the biggest bang for the buck is weight reduction. If you have 10 kilogram weight loss, you can get at least 10 millimeters. Dash eating plan basically is uh, more vegetable, more fruits, more potassium intake and less sodium. Active sodium reduction again. Exercise, everyday walking. Exercise, we in Pakistan, nobody does exercise. You got to do more exercise. The more you walk, the more you can do exercise, you can improve your blood pressure. And of course, it has other benefits, but uh, one of them is lowering of blood pressure. Okay, algebra of the blood pressure. You have a cardiac output. Then you have cardiac output has, so the blood pressure is controlled by three things, heart rate, stroke volume, and systemic vascular resistance. So stroke volume, as you know, is uh, veins. That is the blood that they're delivering back to the heart, and heart is pumping in the arteries, the artery is trying to expand it. So, this is the physiological components of blood pressure. <clears throat> so whenever you're treating the blood pressure in your mind, you should have these three components. And, and sometimes you might need drugs to control all these components. And you have to see which component is playing a little bit more, is more dominant in patient if they are having a high heart rate, anxiety. So you control this. Sometimes you have to you know, uh, tailor your medications accordingly. If they are eating salt, they have edema, they use more diuretics, we'll talk about that. So here is a Chinese menu approach. When you go to a Chinese restaurant in here, you know, they give you a menu and then you select three things from each thing and you have, you know, so it's similar in Pakistan also. So uh, if you look at the stroke volume of the veins, you have the diuretics, you have three diuretics you use, thiazides, loops, aldosterone, and tartanist, so three diuretics. Then you have nitrates, and then of course sometimes it's an ARP can play. Beta blockers in heart rate, and the non-dihydropidine calcium channel blockers, diltiazem and verapamil, and then you have the dihydropyridines, which is uh, more arterial vasodilators such as amlodipine and uh, uh, nifedipine, hydralazine, minoxidil, alpha-1 blockers, all of this 
are basically arterial vasodilators. A's and R sort of are in, you know, are overlapping. You can select uh, one agent from each category to uh, sometimes treat the blood pressure to the numbers. Briefly talk about different trials. I know we have little time here. Uh, you know, trials is another big topic we can talk, but uh, first uh, 20 years, we all focused on diastolic hypertension. And then one SHIP trial came in, we started getting more emphasis on systolic hypertension. SHIP trial sort of put the nail in the coffin that systolic hypertension is as important as diastolic hypertension. So all of these studies, the VA study, the uh, HDF study, the, the Australian National Blood Pressure Study, all of them were looking at diastolic hypertension. Even now, my elderly patients who come to my office, 80, 85 year old, they will tell me, what is my bottom number, doc? They don't care for hypertension. You know, about in 1960s, the, the, the normal systolic blood pressure used to be 100 plus the age. So if you are a 70 year old, your normal blood pressure was 100 plus 70. So, that's, but we have come a long way now. We know from all the trials over after SHEP that it's the systolic hypertension is as important as treating diastolic hypertension. As we know, as we age, our diet, the, the risk of getting diastolic hypertension decreases. So above 50, you will very rarely see patients having diastolic hypertension. So that's about diastolic and systolic. Maybe we can talk more about that. Then uh, we have uh, the UK PDS trial, very important trial uh, for the uh, diabetic study. Uh, we had, uh, I think it's called the prospective diabetic study, all had trial and ASPOT trial. These are the two largest trials done in USA and uh, almost 45,000 patients and uh, ASCOT trial, also a large trial done internationally. And the most recent trials are, of course, INVEST trial, very important on-target trial that has shown us that uh, combination of an ACE and R causes more harm than benefit. Accomplished trial is the only trial that gives us some direction how to treat a combination therapy blood pressures. High wet, which is the hypertension, very elderly trial. This is for patients who are above 80 or 85. And this trial has show, told us that diuretics, are as good as calcium channel blockers and uh, ACE inhibitors. Also, it has told us that a systolic blood pressure 150, 80 might be okay in these patients. Life trial is more about cardiovascular heart failure and LVH. So these are, you know, of course, this each trial, I mean, if we start talking about details of this trial, uh, it can take another an hour on this just on these trials. We're running out of time. A few more points I have to talk. Choice of drug. This is very important. I want like you to pay attention to this and uh, uh, take uh, the take home message is in 2007 American Heart Association and 2010 European Society of Hypertension concluded that the amount of blood pressure reduction is the major determinant in the reduction of cardiovascular risk. Again, the amount of blood pressure reduction is more important than the choice of antihypertension medication. So remember, by hook or crook, you have to bring the blood pressure down. This conclusion has been shown in all hat, value, Camelot, I uh, think in invest, and other trials. I think I only wrote a few trials here. The accomplished trial has tell us that amlodipine and benzoprid is better 
has less cardiovascular events than compared to hydroperothiazide and plus benzoprim. So a diuretic is not the optimum choice in a combination therapy. So monotherapy is mostly recommended by JNC in type or stage 1 blood pressure, which is 20 points above the 140 systolic and 10 above diastolic. And monotherapy, all the trials over the years done have shown that all drugs are almost efficacious, starting from diuretics to angiotensin receptor blockers. Uh, there is some inpatient variability and then some other small factors play. So age inhibitors or ARB, dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers should be used as initial therapy. If you use a thiazide type diuretic, all had trial has shown us that chlorothiridone is more potent and longer acting and works better. So we they suggest that chlorothiridone should be used. And another point here I want to talk about is sequential therapy, that if one drug doesn't work, you can stop it and try the other drug instead of adding drug, stacking up one drug after another. So you try to minimize their, uh, no, uh, their pill burden. So sequential therapy is, if diuretic is not working, you can try a calcium channel blocker or an ACE inhibitor. Uh, so that is called sequential monotherapy. Combination therapy, among patients who have initial blood pressure more than 20, so they are in stage 2 hypertension, okay. The recommended therapy is long-acting ACE inhibitors with ARV plus a long-acting dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, such as amlorapine and nafedipine. And the, 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 the treatment of combination therapy or stage for stage 2 hypertension slightly changed after the accomplished trial. And this is the recommendations I have taken it directly for accomplish and uh, trial and it basically tells you that ACE inhibitors and ARV plus a thiazide diuretic, they suggest to stop thiazide and switching it to a long acting dihydropyridine kind of channel blocker because of the increased uh, cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in the arm that was getting treated with a hydrochlorothiazide part of the combination. Again, briefly, uh, as I promised earlier that we will talk about the compelling indication. So I'll take a few minutes and then we're almost uh, getting out of time. <coughs> Systolic heart failure, we have to use ACE inhibitors. There is data with live trial and other trials. A diuretic, aldosterone antagonist is also uh, from uh, clinical data for that. MI, beta blockers definitely, ACE inhibitors should be part of the blood pressure regimen. Patients with chronic kidney disease, especially who have proteinuria, and they define proteinuria more than 500 milligrams in 24 hours. There is data, there are three or four trials, which has been done over the last 10 years. Number one is renal. Number two is IDNT. Renal is with losartan. IDNT with uh, erbosartan. And then we have the, uh, I think, uh, uh, advanced trial. And then we have uh, avoid trial. Uh, so there are trials. All of them have shown less progression of kidney disease over years, including going on ESRD. So Take home message here, being a nephrologist is if you have somebody who is a diabetic, who have proteinuria and have hypertension, I would uh, keep an ACE inhibitor or ARV in their hypertension regimen. Unless there is a specific contraindication to that, such as hyperkalemia, allergies, angioedema, cough, but majority, I think, can tolerate that. Angina pectoris, basically angina, beta blocker, cancer blockers, nitrates, atrial fibrillation, again, beta blockers, and non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, 
such as uh, uh, diltazium, rapamil, same thing with atrifarin. Okay, we are on the last slide. Um, in conclusion, hypertension is one of the leading cause of cardiovascular morbidity. Now I tried to prove this uh, by certain slides uh, earlier that uh, hypertension can cause uh, heart failure, stroke, peripheral vascular disease. And we talked that as, as physicians, we need our goal is get to the goal, and the goal is 140 over 90 in somebody who has no other compelling indication. But if you're a diabetic or you have chronic kidney disease, the goal should be less than 130 over 80. Prehypertension should not be ignored. It should be taken seriously because patients with prehypertension will develop frank hypertension if nothing has been done. Lifestyle modification is a very important aspect of managing hypertension. We talked quite a bit about lifestyle modification with exercise and salt intake. Then we talked about briefly secondary causes have to be ruled out in resisted hypertension. So if somebody's blood pressure is not controlled with conventional two medications, we have to look for other causes. I will look at the, some of the sleep apnea. I will look at uh, drug interactions. We have to look at steroid use. Look at uh, pheochromocytoma, primary aldosteronism. So that has to be ruled out. Inner vascular disease. And finally, a combination therapy with an ACE or a calcium channel broken or a calcium channel blocker, such as a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, such as uh, nifedipine or loropine have shown better outcomes in a recently accomplished trial. With this, I finish my, conclude my talk, and uh, I want to thank uh, 